All right. It will be Dr. Rusin and his comments, followed by Dr. Reimer and her comments, and then we'll have one preliminary and one follow-up question. If you are ready, Doctor, please proceed. Well, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Yeah, Brent Rusin here, uh, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. And so just uh, like throughout this pandemic, uh, we continue to uh, learn about the virus and uh, through uh, studies and information that's released, uh, we follow uh, what other jurisdictions have been um, uh, doing as well and then review some of that material. So uh, we have um, adjusted and uh, our current measures from time to time. And so at this point, uh, based on some of that uh, evidence, this evolving evidence um, and balancing always those uh, risks and benefits, we're gonna make some changes to uh, our self-isolation requirements. Um, so we're going to be reducing uh, self-isolation or quarantine, uh, the quarantine period for close contacts to 10 days um, from 14 days, still require a uh, self-monitoring for those uh, additional four days. Uh, so the incubation period, this is that time taken uh, between exposure to the virus uh, and when you develop symptoms, not change, it's still 14 days, but what we've seen is that um, the the, the risk of um, becoming a case is, is much greater in the early parts of that incubation period. So it's, uh, if someone hasn't become a case within uh, 10 days, it's very uh, much less likely that they will become a, a case after that. So in fact, if you have a, um, a negative test uh, during that uh, period of isolation, um, there's less than a 1% chance of somebody developing um, infectious COVID after that 10 day mark and um, without a negative test, it's about 1%. Um, uh, so this aligns us with other provinces in, in Canada as well as the uh, United States. And, and really it's all about that, uh, uh, the, the risk and this uh, evolving evidence in that regard. So the, the evidence supports the shortening in the self-isolation period. It allows people to get back to school, work um, a bit sooner. Um, and again, uh, not a significant increase in the risk. Um, so of course, just like any intervention, there's a, a small uh, a risk for that, but uh, a very low risk as we uh, discussed. Um, so the prospect of self-isolation uh, or, or quarantine um, We've seen it's uh, discouraged um, some people with naming contacts. Um, so we're seeing increasing difficulties with uh, people forthcoming uh, about their contacts. Uh, some of that uh, relates to the uh, burdensome uh, the isolation requirements. So by doing this in a safe manner, remove some of that, uh, that burden going forward. So public health has been exempting individuals identified as contacts from self-isolation if they are asymptomatic and fully immunized, or if they had been uh, infected in the past three months uh, at the time of this uh, most recent exposure. Uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, exempt someone identified as a contact from self-isolation if they're asymptomatic and infected within the past six months. We're, we're confident now that the uh, um, immunity from natural infection will um, provide that protection for up to six months. So we're extending that uh, period. So there's no requirements for isolation or quarantine of household members of asymptomatic close contacts or symptomatic people who uh, are not uh, close contacts. So it's recommended that uh, household members wear a mask and physical distance where possible outside the household in these circumstances. And those are the, the fundamentals anyways and uh, avoid leaving the home for non-essential reasons during this period. Um, and of course, this could change with increasing case activity. We see widespread transmission in the community. Where again, we need to uh, look at these measures. Uh, so household members of a close contact, unless otherwise exempt, uh, would need to self-isolate uh, if the close contact becomes symptomatic uh, um, until they get a, a negative test result. And lastly, recommendation for testing of asymptomatic close contacts will change from day 10 to day 7 to align with the revised uh, self-isolation uh, guidance. 
So these measures are not going to be implemented all at once. It will be done over the next several weeks. So uh, it'll take some time to update materials on, uh, uh, as uh, such as a web uh, web fact sheets, et cetera. Uh, so asking for your patience as we work on that. Um, well, public health officials work to mitigate the risks with orders and guidelines. Uh, there's, of course, a, a bigger role for the public to play in this as well. So staying home when we have symptoms, no matter how mild, getting vaccinated if we're eligible, wearing masks, the physical distancing, washing hands are all uh, really important. So, you know, already we're just a, a few days into uh, the school um, this season and, and we've heard uh, many um, uh, reports uh, of, uh, of children needing to be uh, sent home because they're sent to school with symptoms. And so again, we've, we've all done that in, in the past, uh, right? Uh, but uh, our time has changed. Uh, we can't have people going to school or work who have symptoms of, of COVID. Um, we're, um, we're going to see a lot of transmission if, uh, if we continue to do that. So on that note, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, respiratory virus season that's um, going to be upon us uh, soon, uh, like it is every year. So we're going to be moving in to fall and cooler temp temperatures, so more indoor activities will be occurring. And so that makes us think about influenza and uh, RSV. So last year we saw very few cases of influenza and RSV and zero deaths related to influenza. So we had seven total cases reported of the flu, four uh, influenza A, three influenza B, and like we said, zero, zero deaths. And this is really related to um, the, the, the fundamentals, the public health orders, which limited uh, um, you know, contact between people all staying home when ill, wearing that mask, washing our hands. Uh, we saw a record influenza vaccine uptake um, for a seasonal influenza campaign. We are 31.5% uh, and which was up from 26.3% the previous season, which was also a very high number compared to previous uh, seasons. Um, so we said a number of times that uh, we're not going to know precisely uh, what this respiratory virus season will look like. It's very likely. Uh, that we'll see uh, other respiratory viruses circulating once again. Um, we often look to the southern hemisphere to give us a clue about the, the respiratory virus season, especially the influenza that we're going to see. And, and again, there's a lot of reasons why that's not going to be useful this year. There's many um, COVID restrictions still in place. So um, uh, we're going to have to plan uh, to see uh, RSV and influenza circulating here. Um, but we know that uh, many of the things we're doing for COVID protects us from those as well. Uh, staying home when ill, washing hands, um, uh, physical distancing, wearing a mask, uh, and then of course the flu vaccine. So we want uh, all eligible people to be vaccinated for COVID as well as influenza. Uh, so our healthcare system is uh, preparing uh, for a flu and RSV uh, season, uh, but we definitely need your help uh, to keep these numbers down. Our, our system is already uh, strained. So again, practicing those fundamentals will help us uh, against both uh, COVID as well as uh, influenza and RSV. So we saw that uh, the impact this had on the flu cases last year, and so we need to do that again this year to keep uh, those numbers down and limit the impact on the healthcare system. So uh, thanks, and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Reimer. Thank you, Dr. Rusin. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Joss Reimer, the medical lead for the Vaccine Implementation Task Force. As of yesterday, nearly 73% of young people aged 17 or younger had received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and 65% have received both doses. So this youngest cohort <clears throat> was the, the last group to become eligible. And so it does make sense that their numbers are a bit behind the province as a whole. However, it is critical that we provide this group with every opportunity to protect themselves against COVID-19. And we saw with the UK information and the study that the Delta variant is causing more severe illness um, in unvaccinated people compared to Alpha, uh, and that includes in younger people. So getting vaccinated protects youth, uh, it protects their families, including younger siblings who may not be able to get the vaccine at this time. 
It also protects their friends and it protects their community. It helps keep our schools safer. It helps keep our kids in school and helps them uh, continue to be able to do all of the activities that they love. Young people have always been able to get their Pfizer vaccine at our super sites, our pop-ups, and our community clinics. Beginning next week, the COVID-19 vaccines will also begin to be offered in schools. We expect that the first clinics will launch around the 22nd, uh, and we'll start with a few clinics and then build out the program from there. The uh, clinics at the schools will be offered for about four to six weeks uh, from when we begin. Parents and the school community will be notified when a clinic is coming to their school. We are sending letters out today to help give a bit more information about what the process will look like. We have had a number of questions about consent when the vaccine is offered in schools, and we will be handling it slightly differently than we do at our other locations like at our super site. So I wanna take a few minutes to explain how we're organizing the clinics in school as well as after school. So in the schools, young people who are age 16 and older uh, are considered mature minors and can sign their own consent form. This remains the same as what we have done uh, with previous vaccines and will continue to do with this vaccine. However, the difference is for people who are under the age of 16 uh, because they will be required to have written consent from their parent or guardian to be immunized at a clinic that is held in a school during school hours. Planning is also underway, however, to hold uh, community pop-up clinics in the schools after school hours on the same day. So at that time, the vaccine will be available to anyone in the community. Uh, and we want to make sure that if we're in a community with the vaccine, that we're giving as many people the opportunity uh, as possible to be immunized. The after-school clinic uh, may be a good option for a parent and child to come together, for example particularly if the child is afraid of getting a needle, if they have anxiety or other concerns about being immunized at school, uh, or if the child or their parents have any questions that they want to address together. In addition, children who are under 16 and do not have written consent can return to the after-school clinic to go through the informed consent process the same as they do at super sites uh, or pop-up clinics where a medical professional will determine their ability to decide to be immunized. Appointments for the after-school clinics will be booked online or through the call center. There will also be walk-in appointments available. More information will be posted on our online vaccine finder when they are confirmed. The consent form is the same that we've been using for the COVID vaccine. It is available online at manitoba.ca slash vaccine. We will also have printed copies of these available through the schools for households that either don't have access to the internet or to a printer or have any other barriers to uh, getting the online version. So if you are a parent, uh, if you have questions or concerns about the vaccine, uh, we encourage you to talk to your family doctor, talk to your pediatrician. Doctors Manitoba has also held some great town halls on this, uh, specifically on uh, the topic of vaccines for youth uh, with questions for parents. And these are available online and may also be able to help answer some of your questions. This is how we can keep COVID out of our schools, by making the vaccine available and accessible. So thank you to the team who's been working so hard to get this up and running. And with that, uh, we can open up to questions. Thank you, doctors. Just a reminder to our reporters asking questions. We'll start with one preliminary and one follow-up. And up first this afternoon from CBC Radio Canada, Zoe. Hello, good afternoon uh, to both of you. As Dr. Reimer said, immunization teams will attend uh, all schools starting in areas with uh, lower vaccine uptake. It will be for to six weeks. Uh, now, can you give us more specific information on where specifically it will start in a week? Like, do you have specific schedule for all the school divisions, for example? So each regional health authority is connecting um, individually with the school divisions and with the schools to uh, create a schedule that follows the guidance from the province, starting with those who have the, the lowest uptake in those communities 
um, and then moving to the highest uptake after that, but also keeping in mind some of the geographic and logistic concerns. So um, each um, regional health authority is responsible for creating their own schedule and will be reaching out to the schools uh, to set up the exact times and dates with them and we'll be communicating clearly with the schools, with the parents, with the youth about when they can expect those clinics to occur. Thank you for that. Um, and how do you explain the sudden raise of COVID-19 cases as we saw Friday, for example? Well, we're going to see uh, variability in and testing numbers as well as uh, transmission. Um, we may see uh, on a number of days if there's a, a number of contacts, turn cases. So when we're having relatively low numbers, um, we can expect to see day-to-day -day variability. So it's important to follow the trends and important to follow things like test positivity. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, severe outcomes like, such as hospitalization and IC emissions. From CBC Manitoba, Jill. Good afternoon, Dr. Rusin. Um, how many Manitoba schools have confirmed COVID-19 cases to date? And, and why isn't that information uh, posted on the provincial dashboard yet? Yeah, you know, so we're certainly uh, tracking all, uh, all cases and uh, we are going to be working to get that uh, posted. Uh, there's more to come on that. I don't have the uh, um, a specific number here for you. Uh, we're just days into the school year, so a number of cases that are um, in uh, school-aged children um, have not been at school during their infective uh, uh, period. But we're going to have more details on that and hope to have a um, you know a regular posting of it. But uh, we're certainly still tracking it. Okay, and uh, why hasn't mandatory testing for all teachers and school staff who are not fully vaccinated started? Um, well, I think the, uh, I don't have details on, on this. Uh, I think that's a, a question for, uh, for education. And um, so I'm not sure exactly on, on where the timing is. I think that it's, we have a number of, you know, our layered approach there, but I think um, having that testing um, or those uh, that are fully vaccinated being exempt from this testing is uh, is another layer on top of that. So uh, more details on the timing uh, um, would uh, come from uh, education. From CTV Winnipeg, John. CTV Winnipeg. Okay, we'll try for CHVN Taylor. Hi, good afternoon. Um, if there's an instance where, let's say, a child is 14 years old, they go after school to get that vaccine, uh, but their parent does not want them to do it. Uh, what would happen in that situation where a child does get this vaccine, uh, but their their parent or guardian says, no, we don't want it to happen? So there there is in legislation rules that have existed for a, a long time regarding uh, what rights young people have if they are able to understand the the benefits and risks of any health intervention. Um, so we do have to follow the, the legislation that exists. However, we want to be very transparent um, and make sure that parents feel comfortable with the process, which is why we're uh, making sure that uh, the in-school process is a little bit different uh, than what we do in our pop-up clinics and in our super sites. So uh, during school hours, um, we'll have the 16 and 17 year olds uh, and older who are able to uh, consent and sign their own consent form uh, if they don't have a signed consent from a parent. Uh, but those who are younger than 16 uh, would be asked to come back for the pop-up clinic time when their parent could be present with them, um, or if not, where the assessment uh, of their capacity to consent would be done at that time outside of the, the school clinic and instead when it's a community clinic that is opened up to everyone in that community. 
Thanks. Um, and in regards to sending like uh, kids to school or daycare when they're sick, um, parents often do this a lot because it's for them. It's a little bit more, uh, a little easier for them to be called at work than to call in sick at work. What advice do you have for employers right now, uh, who do have parents of children who may need to stay home when they're sick? Yeah, and I think this is this is what we've been kind of dealing with, and and certainly this is one of many uh, challenges that people are facing during uh, during the pandemic. And we, I, I think we're you know when we talk about that we're all in this together. It it, it certainly rings true. Um, so the uh, certainly people uh, we want employers to be uh, to be able to uh, be open and encourage their staff to stay home when sick. Um, the alternative of that is coming to work when sick, meaning that there'll be more people at work uh, who will be be sick uh, soon, uh, and then that uh, translate to uh, to their children uh, as well. So we'd want uh, parents to be able to have that time to have their kids tested um, and uh, have everyone isolate if if necessary. So really, if uh, if we have people going to work or school who are symptomatic, um, we're going to see a lot of community transmission and. And we're going to be really challenged keeping, uh, you know, keeping things uh, moving, like uh, like keeping the kids in school. Thanks. Trying again for John at CTV. Yes, can you hear me now? Hello, Dr. Rusin, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what was going on uh, before then. Uh, my question for Dr. Rutin, um, there is a Winnipeg school division that's working on a draft policy which would mandate that students who are able to be vaccinated would must be vaccinated in order to participate in extracurricular activities. I'm just curious uh, what public health uh, thinks about such a policy and also they would require them to go to a uh, Manitoba testing site, are uh, people who may not be symptomatic um, able to go and uh, get a test like that? Right, so, you know, so overall, uh, the public health message has been clear. Um, a vaccine uh, is uh, the best way uh, to limit the impact of this uh, fourth wave that's, that's coming towards us. Uh, so the more places that uh, are requiring vaccine, uh, the more likely we're going to be able to keep um, much of what we want to do uh, moving through this uh, fourth wave. So I won't speak specifically on that plan because I haven't seen uh, that plan. Um, uh, testing in the provincial testing sites is, is supposed to be for symptomatic uh, individuals right now. We, we, we don't want those sites used for asymptomatic uh, testing. So as of right now, that's um, the the advice um, for uh, for our testing sites. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Reimer, my, I have a question just about the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is recommending um, a third shot, um, I'm not calling it a booster, but a third shot for individuals who are immunocompromised. Will Manitoba be offering that? So we're just finalizing um, our recommendations in Manitoba and uh, plan to have recommendations uh, on immunocompromised dose three later this week. Thank you. Moving on to the free press, Katie. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Rusin. You mentioned the um, self-isolation time um, changing. Can you clarify when that's going to come into effect? And I'm also wondering if we're going to be seeing a return to any self-isolation requirements for travelers. Yeah, and so these, uh, we don't have a specific date. They're all of these, uh, there's a number of changes that we're making. So they're going to be coming in at various times over the next couple of weeks or so. Um, as far as travelers, you're still uh, those that are not fully vaccinated. Um, coming uh, entering Manitoba are still required to um, isolate for for 14 days, um, and uh, that's uh, we are looking at uh, decreasing that to the to the 10 days as well. But that hasn't uh, that won't take uh, shape in the orders within the next uh, couple of weeks or so. But for now, unvaccinated uh, people uh, entering Manitoba uh, will still have to isolate for 14 days. 
um, with uh, some uh, exemptions to that. Thank you. And Dr. Reimer, has the focus of the vaccine task force switched to focusing on youth or are you still identifying areas that need to be prioritized within the adult population? And the reason I ask that is because there could be a perception that any Manitoba adult that doesn't yet have the vaccine doesn't want it, but have you found that to be the case or are there still areas that need to be looked at to prioritize um, accessibility of the vaccine? So the, the task force certainly is uh, putting a lot of effort into improving accessibility for youth, but that is by no means the only group that we want to continue to reach out to. Um, there's many people in Manitoba that still are not against the vaccine, but haven't either prioritized it in their own lives or continue to face a lot of barriers to getting uh, health care of any type, including the vaccine. So we will continue to have outreach clinics in many settings. Uh, we had some clinics that uh, ran out of Assiniboine Park, out of Kildonan Park over the weekend. We had uh, good success with clinics that ran out of some of the malls in the city as well. Um, and we're continuing to do things like mobile outreach uh, in different parts of the province. Um, we've been having clinics that go to some of the encampments. Um, and uh, ongoing outreach uh, at community organization facilities as well. So youth is really important, particularly because right now they have the lowest level of uptake compared to other age groups, um, but all ages are still critical to get vaccine numbers as high as possible if we wanna continue to um, push back the, the beginning or at least the height of this fourth wave. And so we will continue to work on all of these um, areas, all of these age groups at the same time. From Global News, Brittany. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Russo. We spoke to you um, when you released the new public health orders and we talked about um, provincial employees and teachers that were gonna need that mandatory testing if they weren't vaccinated. There were still a lot of details that were being worked out if it was going to be rapid testing or they'd have to go to a site, who was going to be paying for it, how often it would have to happen. Have any of those details been yet worked out and can you share them? So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, been done in each of these uh, sectors. Uh, so it will be, um, you know, uh, rapid uh, testing um, that, that we'll be using. Um, uh, some of the details though uh, are still being worked out. So, uh, but uh, we do have uh, the, the high level information. We, we know that we'll be able to implement this, um, but uh, the details to be announced, um, you know, in the near future. Thank you. And is there going to be a cutoff date as to when that's going to have to happen and, and those are going to start to have to happen on a regular basis? And if they are going to be, um, do we have any idea how that could impact our test positivity if we have more people being tested multiple times a week that aren't symptomatic? Yeah, so there will be uh, a, a specific date. Again, we haven't landed on on that uh, at this point. Uh, it shouldn't really. We don't expect it to uh, affect our test positivity per se, because the um, the the rapid tests in these uh, situations won't be going into the denominator of uh, of our testing. Um, the, those who test positive on the rapid test will have to have it confirmed through our sites. But um, overall, this shouldn't have much impact on, on test positive. From the Brandon Sun, Colin. Good afternoon. Uh, I think I saw a couple days ago that uh, Pfizer BioNTech is looking to get a younger uh, group approved for use with the uh, their vaccine. If it is approved, is the province ready to step up its uh, school vaccination efforts? So we've uh, heard a few different dates uh, from Pfizer on that. Initially, they had told us that they were expecting end of September, early October, that they would have data ready for submission. But uh, more recently, the FDA requested that they increase their sample size or the number of youth in their young people uh, in their studies, which meant that they were going to be delayed until the end of the calendar year. 
Now in the United States, we're seeing quite an increase in the number of young people ending up in hospital. And so there's been um, a shift in pressure uh, the other direction to try to uh, submit data sooner and have the FDA review things sooner. Um, and so it's a bit uh, up in the air right now about when the submission will occur and uh, how quickly the FDA might approve something. And then likewise, um, Health Canada uh, would be uh, likely following similar procedures. Uh, certainly what the FDA does does not dictate what happens in Canada, but Health Canada and the FDA to, do try to work collaboratively uh, on their approaches. So um, I think we have to do a little bit of, of wait and see about whether or not Pfizer um, submits data to Health Canada earlier, but that is uh, certainly we're starting to hear rumblings that perhaps we can expect something earlier than the end of this calendar year from Pfizer, uh, at least for those uh, kids who are five to 11. Uh, it doesn't sound like they're ready yet for those who are younger than five. Thank you. Um, my second question, uh, with the election a week away, I, I was wondering if either of you had any concerns about um, polling sites, advanced polling sites, election offices, being a source of uh, cases or, or risk, or if you think it's likely going to be safe for Manitobans to get out and vote? Sure, these, uh, uh, all these areas will still be uh, needing to follow the, the public health order. So we'll still have all those fundamentals and safety features. We still require people to screen for symptoms, um, wearing a mask uh, indoors, uh, distancing hand hygiene. So uh, I think that uh, we'll still be able to uh, manage this in, in a safe manner. From CJOB, Skyler. Hi, Dr. Rusin. Uh, with some of the concerns, you know, especially over in Alberta, that's been making a lot of news lately. Uh, how, how do you feel about uh, kind of where Manitoba is at? We're certainly not at that sort of situation where they're running out of hospital capacity. But, um, you know, do you feel a bit of a time crunch uh, when it comes to getting more people vaccinated and avoiding that type of situation here? So uh, certainly we're, uh, we're at risk uh, of that. We've uh, met a lot of Manitobans have um taking us up on the on the vaccine um uh, but we still have many uh many more manitobans to go so we are seeing um that transmission occurring uh, so we're still seeing those case numbers we're still seeing people being admitted to icu again almost entirely unvaccinated people uh, that are being admitted to icu and then we're still seeing some increased transmission in, in certain areas um uh, you know we're seeing higher case numbers in in southern uh, health region higher test positivity uh, in that region and um, uh, ICU admissions uh, from there. So again, we're, uh, we're following uh, those case numbers uh, quite closely. Uh, and um, if you know transmission continues on this way, then uh, we could uh, be at risk to, to look like uh, some of our, our neighbors to the west who are seeing uh, much higher cases. Okay, thank you for that. And when we see the uh, the case breakdown now with the unvaccinated cases, is there any indication of how many uh, of those cases are people who are eligible for a vaccine and uh, haven't received one yet? And then how many are um, maybe youth bef born before two or after two thousand nine, um, you know, who are unvaccinated but they don't have a say in the matter at this point? Yeah, so we, so we we do have those numbers. I don't have the specifics uh, with me on that. Uh, you know, the highest. Uh, age cohort of cases right now is in that 20 to 29 age group, so they're all uh, certainly eligible for vaccine. Um, and we're, we're seeing that, um, you know, two thirds, about two thirds or, or greater of the new cases we see are, are in the unvaccinated. And then that number is, uh, you know, amplified when we're talking about severe outcomes. So, uh, and, and, you know, hospitalized patients, about 80% are unvaccinated. And then uh, we've seen very, very few um, uh, people admitted to ICU who have been uh, fully vaccinated and uh, the time uh, to develop immunity. And then what we've seen in those cir circumstances, very short uh, admissions to ICU and, and discharge. So um, the, the, the power of that vaccine is very, very clear. And from the Winnipeg Sun, Glenn. 
Um, yes, Dr. Reimer, um, I see from the vaccine uh, bulletin, we announced about the school pop-ups and there are several other pop-ups uh, listed on the, the vaccination or the vaccine bulletin. Is this where we're going to be heading to more towards taking the vaccine to where people are? Or is this sort of a supplement to what we're currently doing? As in, will this be pretty, I shouldn't say pretty much, but will this be the, um, how we tackle this thing going forward? The super sites were really efficient at reaching large numbers of Manitobans, particularly those who were very eager to be vaccinated. And when we had many, many thousands of people uh, getting the vaccine every day, uh, it was essential that we had an efficient mechanism to offer that vaccine to everybody who was eligible and wanted it. Um, but we're seeing now that the, the majority of people who haven't had the vaccine yet either are those who have concerns or questions about the vaccine or were not well served by the super sites. So we've uh, certainly in the task force tried to shift our efforts and our focus away from the super sites towards more accessible options. So we are every day running uh, pop-up clinics in settings that are more convenient for different people and trying to regularly expand where these vaccines are available uh, to try to reach um, everybody who might be experiencing barriers to getting care like getting a vaccine. So absolutely, our focus right now is on uh, being as accessible as possible to everyone in Manitoba. And that's why you're seeing that we are running clinics out of community centers, out of uh, parks, in malls, in um, you know, provincial parks, there's been a, a huge effort in every region to uh, look at their local settings and see where peer, people may be experiencing those barriers and setting up clinics in those, those, those locations. Sometimes we advertise them broadly and other times uh, we really try to target to the narrow community and so don't spend um, a lot of our efforts on the advertising to the whole province, but these are occurring uh, regularly every single day around the province and we will continue to put a lot of effort into reducing barriers for people. Uh, my follow-up is for Dr. Rusin, I guess. Um, at two o'clock this afternoon, there's another protest rally or rally uh, scheduled for the Health Sciences Center. Would you care to weigh in on on you know, should people be attending these uh, sort of rallies and should they be at hospitals uh, and such? You know, so I think that the, the real, uh, you know, my message is the, um, you know, the, the gratitude and respect that I have for the uh, frontline healthcare workers who have been at this for, for 18 months, uh, working uh, overtime there for Manitobans when we need them the most. It's taking a toll on them personally. And so um, I don't see the connection of any uh, protest that interferes with uh, the great work that they're uh, doing. So I think, uh, of course, there's rights to, to protest. Um, these are very challenging times for, you know, for uh, all Manitobans. But my uh, advice is, and my, is that um, we all uh, ensure we show uh, respect and gratitude for the the hard work that those uh, frontline workers are doing. All right, folks, we've got a couple more minutes for a couple more questions. Anybody want to go ahead? Yeah, I got a question about um, just some recommendations uh, in school. Maybe Dr. Rusin, you'd be best suited to answer this one. Uh, there's uh, some concerns for parents because uh, they have a you know a yet unvaccinated kid because of their age um, who's sitting uh, with you know some older kids maybe a mix of vaccinated and unvaccinated at uh, at the lunch table. Um, and then they're not wearing masks, of course, because they're eating. So should there be some sort of distancing uh, between groups uh, or anything like that uh, in the lunchroom? So we have a number of guidelines with uh, with education uh, on this. And so um, we know that in, in those that are unvaccinated, we're still using um, uh, cohorts in those younger age groups. So can't really speak to the specifics of what uh, what's being seen in these areas. But, um, you know, overall, our, our plans and recommendations with education do address these type of uh, issues. 
Dr. Reimer, I'm just wondering if any schools have refused to host vaccine clinics and how you're dealing with pushback from parents. You know, so at this point, we're still in discussions with all of the schools as far as the the timing, uh, the dates, um, and the setup of all of the different clinics uh, that will be running in all the different schools. So there haven't been any uh, final decisions against running clinics in any of the schools. We want to spend a lot of time to address concerns that the schools may have, um, address concerns that the parents may have, and find ways to offer an accessible option to students who wouldn't have another mechanism to get the vaccine, but still making sure that uh, we're doing it in a way that parents are comfortable with, um, that the community can trust, and that is uh, transparent and um, to everyone so that they um, know what to expect of our clinics. So, you know, it's very important that we continue these discussions with the, with the school divisions and with the individual schools uh, so that they can also be working with their, their community and their parents um, as we book these clinics. But right now, uh, we haven't finalized the schedule, so there's no um, final in or out um, uh, dates or times for any of the schools uh, to share. And do you mind just clarifying why why teens under the age of 16 who don't have parental consent um, can't be evaluated for mature consent at schools, but can uh, at super sites and other clinics? So there was a lot of concern from parents around um, what might happen in the schools and, and uh, feeling some um, lack of comfort with the approach that is consistent with how we've done all other vaccine clinics in the past, but certainly may not have um, gotten attention and, and people may not have been aware of how those clinics are usually run. And so we're trying to find a mechanism that both respects the rights of, of the youth, but also uh, is clear to parents so that they know what to expect, so that they know um, what will be offered uh, or not offered to their children. Um, because we want the community to feel uh, safe. We want the community to feel that this is um, a trusted intervention, even if they don't uh, want to go ahead with the intervention, that they feel that they can trust how our clinics will be run. And so after discussions with the schools, with the school divisions, uh, we're trying to find a mechanism that, that does both, which is why we want within school hours uh, to have the, the parental consent as core to anyone who's under 16, but having that option still that reduces barriers for the kids who can't get that consent um, and would be able to come after hours where it's uh, run the same way as all of our other community clinics. And so this is the, the, the play that we're trying to balance between the concerns of families along with the rights of youth um, to be clear to families about how we're gonna be approaching this and what their kids can expect. Time for a couple more. Hi, this is Taylor. Uh, a year ago at this time, it was public health who put out individual letters, um, including uh, sending it through the media whenever there was a potential school uh, exposure of COVID. Um, I know Dr. Rusin, you said education is the one who's leading this up, but can you explain why public health isn't doing this again this year? Well, uh, public health is uh, uh, quite involved with uh, with education on this, so we're we're just working on that on what the process will be. So certainly public health is involved in the case and contact investigation and then the outbreak management, um, but the the actual uh, reporting of it, um, there's uh, more to come shortly on on the specifics. Thanks. Last question, anyone? Yeah, Dr. Rusin, I'm just wondering if you could outline for us what constitutes an outbreak within a school um, and when a cohort or class or even a school moves um, to remote learning at this point. Yeah, and so when, when public health is investigating things like outbreaks and defining them, it's not uh, uh, um, that useful having black and white definitions, right? It's, uh, it depends on a number of the circumstances. So where the outbreak is going to be if we see in-class uh, transmission, uh, that may or may not involve uh, two uh, cases or more. It just depends on the circumstances. When we would have a, an entire cohort isolating, again, depends on a number of, of the circumstances there. It would depend on the vaccine 
uh, uptake could depend on what we're seeing in the community at that time, the nature of the transmission that's occurring. So uh, we don't have black and white things that uh, just immediately um, uh, tell us to do things. We need to uh, look at the entirety of the evidence and, and move on that. Thanks. And Thank one you. last question. Can you say, if, are we in a fourth wave? And again, this there isn't a specific uh, definition, uh, um, you know, of a wave. I think that if we look at the the numbers, um, especially in in the uh, the south right now, um, uh, it's very likely that we're in the early stages of a fourth wave. We're starting to see a little bit in hospitalization, and I see. So, um, I think that it would. Um, it's very likely that we're at the beginnings of a, of a fourth wave. Do you thank mind repeating you, that? We just thank cut you, out for a everyone. second. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our go-to session.